Let's tape forever. Here's your weekly dose of relationship fuel with Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Hello and welcome to Date Forever. In this week's episode, we're chatting about the challenges of coming out as bisexual or same-sex attracted, transforming a monogamous relationship into a polyamorous relationship, deeply knowing yourself to design your life and relationship, and how including advocacy in your life can make an impact on both you and the world. But before we jump into that, Sammy, what's been fueling you up this week? I had lots of things that fueled me up in this last week. Mm. We had a really nice date night. We did, yeah. Pretty low-key, casual restaurant, Mm. close to home. I think it was what we needed after a couple of big weekends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We had a commitment-free Sunday. Yeah. Which was delightful. But another surprising thing that probably fueled me up was that you and I had a hard conversation last week. Mm. And I, I say hard- in the way that it was maybe uncomfortable because you had disappointed me with something. And although we air a lot of dirty laundry on this podcast, (laughs) I'm going to keep this one to myself. Um, And we had a really – it sparked a really constructive conversation. And by leaning into that, I think we grew closer together. Mm. And it was a moment of reflection for me about – how a previous version of Sammy and Nath would have handled a similar situation to how we handle that now. And it's, it was just like a real moment of growth and recognition mm. um, for myself, for yourself and, and for us. So that really kind of like, it, although it was not particularly pleasant, it still fueled me up. Yeah. What about you, Nath? What fueled you up? Mine was one of the things that we did on our blank Sunday, which was doing a bit of a deep dive into some of our finances and doing some learning via an online course that we've purchased. And so, yeah, it was really nice to talk about some of our long-term plans for our money and our wealth and our wealth building strategy and learn together about a few of these things. So, neither of us are money experts, neither of us take a huge fancy in money or those sorts of things. We like money. We do like money. And money is such a great vehicle for like options and opportunities and creating impact, but neither of us are nerdy about it. Money gurus, no. So, yeah, it was really nice to to learn a few new things together, have some big conversations, and this is just the start of uh, this little money course. It's a bit of a 12-week program, so, yeah, really excited for the next few weeks ahead of us too. I like that you called that one out, and I think, like, a lot of the things that we've been working on this year, a lot of our goals for this year have been very future-centric, very much about taking care of our future tank, Um, Like we set a really big savings goal for this year. Um, We did our wills and organized some insurance. We are investing in um, our our own knowledge around wealth generation and figuring out, you know, what do we want out of the next Mm. decade, two decades, three decades and beyond. So I I like that you said that one because, yeah, it it was nice to invest some time um, and energy into learning together. Yeah, and it's not just about our today selves, but looking forward to our future selves too. So, But now I'm super excited to introduce this week's guest. Today we have Steve Spencer joining us. Steve is a prominent bisexual and HIV advocate, best known for his work promoting bi visibility and fighting HIV stigma. He has been featured on SBS Insights' Bisexuality episode and he made global headlines when he publicly disclosed his HIV status. Steve works in a range of roles in LGBTQIA plus community health and was recently recognised with an ACON Honour Award in Health and Wellbeing. From running pegging workshops to consulting federal MPs, Steve always brings a message of inclusivity and joy. Welcome to the show, Steve. Woo, thanks for having me. Oh, no worries. I think this will be a fun episode. (laughs) Hey, um, I think that we should share with everyone how we met because it was pretty serendipitous. Um, We met during World Pride uh, in the middle of a closed off Sydney Harbour Bridge with thousands of others around us. Um, And Nate and I had stopped to take a photo and I'd climbed on Nate's shoulders. And then I spotted you with your beautiful bisexuality flag. And I said, hey, can I borrow that? (laughs) So that's the moment that we met. And then later that day uh, at the closing party for Sydney World Pride, I spotted you wearing trainers 
a G string and a Teletubby backpack. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was it. Um, I think I had a backwards cap on too and socks. Oh, yeah. Oh, mate. <laughs> and socks. And you socks. might have lost that by that stage. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so I felt very lucky that we uh, ran into each other twice in one day. Um, so I feel like we were meant to meet. Um, and then we had a pretty cool conversation about uh, your life and what you're you, – what you've overcome and where you're going. So I'm really excited to be sharing that with uh, everyone, publishing this on the internet for everyone and anyone to hear. So I think the best place to start is my assumption that you were not always as out loud and proud as what your bio just shared. So take us way back to the beginning. Tell us about Steve before he was a prominent bisexual and HIV advocate. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I've always been exciting in my own way at at different points in my life but when I was younger it was in a way more selfish way you know just going through life having fun and you know I was always very experimental and sort of exploratory and um and I'm very lucky to have to like have that trait and I had a really good upbringing I had a a really accepting family and but things are always a lot more complicated than they seem um but then it was really in my sort of mid twenties when I sort of woke up and and went, what are you doing to make this world a better place? You know, you can't just go through life having fun, doing things for yourself. How can you actually give back? Because the community that I'm a part of, there's such a rich history of giving back, a rich history of being a part of a community, making a difference, seeing wrongs, and seeing what you can do to right those wrongs. And I don't know, it, it, there were just sort of numerous moments where the, the light bulb moment, you know, went off and I sort of um, went, okay, this is, this is something that I can do. This is something that makes me feel good. This is something that connects me with other people and it's something that really enriches my life. And it sort of started with my HIV advocacy. So it started back when, um, when PrEP came out and I, th- and I thought, why don't we have this more available uh, at the time, there was a trial with 100 people on it. And I turned to my friends and I said, well, you know, we can do better than that. Let's get access to, to thousands of people. We we built a, a network of um, online providers. And uh, by the time we'd finished our project, the, we had effectively blackmailed the government into opening up a trial for 10,000 people for PrEP. And now we've seen HIV, um, HIV rates in Australia just go um, rock bottom, and we're going to be the first place in the world to see the end of HIV transmission, which is really exciting. And wow. that was sort of my first taste of advocacy. That was my first taste of I can just be this person on this rock and actually make a difference. And you know, from there as well, um, it was it wasn't until my mid twenties that I came out as bisexual. And I suppose the interesting part of that story is I came out as gay when I was thirteen. But when I came out as bisexual, one of the most important things I learned from my mentors around me is, is how important visibility is. And I never really considered not being loud and proud about it because I didn't have that many people to look up to. I learned when, when I did come out, every time someone came up to me, every time a stranger on the Sydney Harbour Bridge comes up to me and asks <laughs> to wave the, our, our bi pride flag just makes life worth living and that's that's how i've ended up where i am it's a joyous life to be able to to do things to make a change that don't just benefit you but benefit the people around you so steve you already mentioned that your parents and your family network are really really supportive so my hunch is that that's how you were in a position to know yourself that deeply at 13 to come out yeah definitely and you know i was the only out person at my school of 2000 people but I was supported. Uh, I was the first queer prefect at the school. It was sort of like there was a system waiting for me to step into it. I'm from a rural area. I'm from a 300-acre cattle farm just outside of Melbourne. And my parents are quite conservative. But despite that, I, I grew up in a very I don't know, humanistic community, a humanistic family where you treat people the way you want to be treated. And it was quite interesting when I came out as same-sex attracted. That's sort of the way that I describe it now because Mm. as a bisexual man, for me to say that I came out as gay, it sort of erases what my actual identity was because I've always been bi. But when I came out as a same-sex attracted back then, the automatic reaction is, oh, well, then you're you're gay, you're gay. Um, You know, oh, so you're attracted to other boys? Well, that just means you're gay and that's totally fine. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be very proud. And I just went along with it and said, okay, yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. Um, went to therapy, which, you know, very lucky to have at that time as well. And 
um, you know, sort of a misguided progressivism to be told, oh, you know, you, oh, you don't have to pretend that you still like girls. Like, you know, it's fine to be gay. Um, mm. And then it took a, a while for me to realize, oh, no, no, no. Like, I still very much am attracted to women. I still very much have these strong bisexual urges, which I had to repress being in the gay community. It's not easy being bi. Um, in my early 20s, it was really tough. You know, we you know we know about this term down low, right? We usually apply that term to, to straight men who are secretly in the closet and about their same-sex attraction. But there are so many gay men out there that are down low who, because of the biphobia that we face within our own community, just can't come out. And there just came to a point where I had nothing to lose. Uh, there came a point where I was just sick of waiting in life's waiting room. And life is there to be lived. And so I just came out in a big flurry and, you know, waved my flag around. And, you know, by doing that, you know, the energy you put out into the universe comes back to you. And when I showed that I'm not afraid, when I showed my true colors, when I showed who I really am and started living fully and genuinely as the person that I am, life just got so much better. Like despite all the tough stuff, like despite the biphobia bi 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 and bi-erasure and everything I faced, I really really came into my own and and I'm, and I'm so grateful for that and you know my family during all of this you know you asked about my family when i came out as same-sex attractive they were really really understanding but one really interesting thing is my parents said to me oh um you know yes we we accept you for this but keep an open mind i, I think i think almost verbatim what they said was keep you know keep an open mind and in my mind, you know, back when I was young, I didn't, I didn't know any better. I sort of took that as homophobia. I'm like, what do you mean? No, I'm very, very certain of this. And I didn't find out until my mid-20s that pretty much most of the men in my family are also bisexual. My parents told me that both of my half-brothers are bisexual. And then also later in my 20s, my dad has opened up to me about his own bisexuality. Mm -hmm. And by me being open about my sexuality has enabled the other men in my family to also talk openly about it. Before, it was very much a hidden secret. And now we're all talking about it. And I realize like, oh, I'm not alone and I'm not weird at all. In fact, I'm. this is what you would expect. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, so it's been a journey, not just a personal one, but one that I've shared with my family. Um, mm. And then the one that I share with my friends, and then inevitably it's one that I share with my romantic partners as well. Yeah. yeah. It's such an interesting journey that you've been on. And right. it is really interesting to think that bisexuality is almost less understood or, or less accepted than being gay. I think there's almost a black and white thing about being gay or not, but it's the gray area of bisexuality that is kind of less understood. Yeah, it is. And like the weird thing is that of the LGBTIQ plus community, bi people make up 60% of that community. So we're, yeah. we're this like hidden majority. And it's, and it's because people, because we don't have that visibility. And that's why I think it's really important for me to be out there and be visible. And I know that every room that I enter into, you know, every talk that I do, there are people that can learn something and there, there are people that can take away something. And they tell me, they, they let me know, like, you know, Steve, this is an experience that I've shared and I haven't been able to put words to it. And just being able to have, to be able to see yourself is really, really important. Mm. And that's something that I was always looking for. I was looking for, you know, who, who am I? Well, what, what, are, what are the potentials for me? Um, and it's the same thing with like relationships as well. It's like, there are these rules, you know, this is what your sexuality should look like. This is how you should behave in your community. This is how your relationships should look like. And I always knew that I was very different to my surroundings. My sexuality is different to the gay people that are around me. Um, and then what it turns out in my later years, my relationships are very different to what are, ex what are expected of us. And so to be able to, to actually see good examples, healthy examples of who, who you can be, uh, people who share experiences with you, I just think it's like awesome. And really, you've ended up with two coming out stories, not one. Yeah, <laughs> and it's always happening as well. Like, you know, mm. any any queer person understands that coming out, to, it's an ongoing process. Mm. Um, and the reactions go from, oh, really, to, oh, really? And, um, <laughs> and, you know, whether it's a good or a bad reaction, it's always, you know, education is a really important thing. But, um, you know, one thing that I would have told myself younger is come out earlier. But also, there is way less to be afraid of than you think. The capacity for people to be compassionate and to have patience for you is incredible. When I came out, I just thought, and I was told this by people, you, 
you know, what what kind of woman would be attracted to me? What kind of person would be attracted to a bi man? You know, it's an unattractive trait, and I internalized that. And then when I actually got there, got out there into the world and actually started living my life, I went, what I've been told my entire life is wrong. Mm. Like th- there are incredible people, incredible div- diversity of people, and I can actually have everything that I want, everything that I thought was closed off from me because I'm bisexual, because I'm HIV positive. Those walls, they, ex- they, they exist, but I choose not to see them or, or to jump over them. And, mm. you know, to be able to tell pe- other people, you can also jump over them is really important to me because it's something that I wish I was told younger. Mm. And I think you've like touched on something that's so important about that visibility and about that it's really difficult to be what you can't see. Yeah, so that's it. Not only have you had the opportunity to step into that full, authentic sense of self for yourself, but you've also given other people to step into their complete, authentic self as well. Yeah, and it becomes a shared experience and it becomes a, a movement and you can really feel that you're a part of it and and it's just the best feeling. And and you can even see over time, since I've come out, I just see so many more people, not because of me, just because I am one person part of a bigger movement, a bigger movement where we're realising the world isn't black and white. The rules that we were taught don't exist. You get to make your own rules. You get to live the life that you want and you can have that life. Yeah. And I mean, we're in Australia now and I, and we can point back to a, a moment in time that was not that long ago where it was not possible for people within the rainbow community to get married and yeah. to have that legally recognized. So for me, I've definitely found that, um, that there was almost like a real line in the sand where it, almost there was a lot more permission to show up as full authentic self with some almost like permission a little permission slip that this is we now we now give consent we now give permission we now um say that this is okay yeah so steve i'm really curious like how was your relationship with yourself before you came out as bisexual versus after because you you talked about being able to step into your full self but what was that relationship with self like while you were denying a part of who you were um one word awful awful (laughs) and you don't realize until you know, retrospect is is a great thing. Be able to look back and actually see, oh my gosh, like why did I have all of these awful behaviors? You know, um, addiction issues, um, behavioral issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, all of this stuff that at the time you're sort of trying to think what's wrong with me. And then you realize that there was actually a turning point in your life. And I can't express enough how important coming out is to someone it, it can be so freeing for the soul and anyone that's had to come out understands how good life is out of the closet. And, you know, for, for me looking back, I was like, wow, th- that was my turning point. I started going to the gym. I started having a much more positive view of myself. I, I started actually exploring the parts of my life that I wish I'd always explored. I'd opened myself up to new opportunities and new people and just stopped forcing myself to do things that I didn't want to do and be a person that I didn't want to be. Um, you know, I've been in therapy for a number of years and, and you know, the, the number one thing that my therapist has told me I've learned, it's that I have found the ability to do things for myself and not do things for other people. And when you're in the closet, you know, especially as a bisexual man who has come from an experience of being gay and within the gay community, there are so many expectations placed on you, how you should behave, what you should do. And so for me to free myself of that and actually go, you know what, those behaviors weren't healthy for me. They weren't making my life better. They weren't they weren't enriching me or doing anything good for me. I can now go, no, I, I'm going to do these things for myself. Well, you know, not so much for myself, but, you know, for my soul to actually nourish myself and and acknowledge the good things about myself and acknowledge the bad things about myself and work on them, you know. I think there's real power in acknowledging um, the parts of ourself and, like, the that opportunity to, like, step into full power, the full sense of self, um, owning your own story, your own um, representation and how you want to be seen in the world. But I think that really does start with, like, being able to accept that for yourself. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And... It, it took me a while to realize how important coming out was to me. And, and it wasn't something sort of deliberate. It was actually as soon as I freed myself of those shackles, I could run. And, and, I, did, and I, I thought when I was younger that I was able to 
to live a fun life. But what I was living was not a fun life. It was a shackled one. And now I know what it actually feels like to be free and, and, and enjoy life. So yeah. cheeky question. So you said yeah. you came out for the second time when you were about 20, tw- early 20s. Can I ask, how old are you now? I am 31. Okay. So you've <laughs> had a good decade flying the bi flag. Yeah, around about. It was my mid-20s when I came out. Um, so yeah, g- lots of experience. And like the, the funny thing is I learned everything I know on the fly. Like there is no manual on how to do this. And there are so few bi men out there who provide mentorship or who provide like a positive role model, the way that our media represents bi men is always not great. And um, bi men within the queer community are often ostracized and bi men in broader society are also often ostracized. And so it's, it was difficult. I sort of had to write my own rules, but then that's also really fun because then I get to experiment and, and try new things and, and learn that a rule book isn't a good thing. You can you can do whatever you want. Mm. Yeah. So how has like coming out as bi then changed your view on relationships and yeah your ability to be in a, a long term relationship or, or whatever that relationship looks like for you? Yeah. So I've been in a long term relationship with my male partner Andrew for four and a half years now, and funny enough, that was my first ever relationship. Um, and I met him just a few months after I came out. And so when I say that there's this turning point in my life, before I came out, there would be no way I'd be able to hold a relationship. I was a mess, you know, I was a mess. And be, and, and coming out actually enabled me to to get my life together and improve on myself and and improve my relationship with myself and, and who I am as a person. And, you know, like I said before, the energy you put out, you get back. And so I was just full of love and openness and and I met this wonderful man, and and he has just been my shining light, my bedrock. Um, you know, I, someone I, I, I'm speechless. I you know I love him so much, and we've got such a beautiful relationship. But then you know because I've met him just after I came out, and I still had a, a lot of understanding of what my sexuality looks like and and feels like. Um, it was very precarious and, and probably still is. There's still so much I, I'm learning about myself. And, you know, when you actually think about sexuality, romantic and sexual attraction and how that interacts with your relationships with other people, it's really complicated. Um, and so my relationship with my partner, it's it hasn't looked the same. Like we started off monogamous and then moved into an open relationship, and then moved into a polyamorous relationship, and what our sex life looks like has totally changed. What our friendship, because we have a friendship, of course, what mm. that, what our friendship looks like has changed as well. But there's just one constant line through all of that, no matter what the change is. There's patience, there's overwhelming love, um, and there's support. And I'm, I'm really lucky. Like, you know, he's a gay man, so he doesn't necessarily understand what I go through but he understands that it's important for me to be able to live my full self. And so that's how we moved into an open relationship and then a polyamorous relationship. And then now that's enabled me to have other really wonderful relationships with people. And, you know, there's, there's one, okay, before I go further, like there's that, (laughs) I'm a walking stereotype in so many ways, but like (laughs) there's that stereotype that bisexual people can't make up their mind or that we're greedy and, you know, Oh, you're going to leave, you know, there's a concern on a partner's behalf. If you're in a relationship with a bi person, there's that there's that complete myth, oh, that they're going to leave you for someone of a different of the different gender to that person. And you know, none of those myths are true. But like for me and my own experience, my bisexuality and my relationships are two very very important things, and I need the people in my life to understand that. And for me to be able to live my life properly, to have a good relationship with myself, and spread my wings. You know, I need people around me that understand that. And that's all about setting clear boundaries. It's all about consent between everyone. Like, that's so, so, so important. It's like, you know, funny enough, there's a large polyamorous community within the bi community. Now, the two things aren't, you know, they're they're correlated. but Yeah, yeah. yeah, (laughs) Correlation versus causation. causation. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, You know, but it might just be because we, we have lived outside of the black and white. Um, we, we understand ourselves a lot, you know, it takes a lot of bravery and a lot of self-discovery to, 
to come out and, and live openly and live, you know, also within yourself as a bi person. And so, you know, we look at our relationships and and explore new ways of having relationships as well. And um, that's certainly been my experience. And so, you know, I, I like to say I'm not polyamorous because I'm bisexual. Those two are different things. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it enables me to, to have a good life. And as long as the people around me are consenting to it and uh, understanding of it, then, you know, it actually also makes everyone around me enjoy their lives more as well. Um, you know, I, I also say to my partner, you know, um, happy wife, happy life. Now, that's a bit problematic, <laughs> but... <laughs> It's a bit problematic, but but we we look at each other and and we we say that to each other because we want each other to be happy. We want each other to be together, but we want each other to be happy, and we will enable each other to have that happiness, however it is, because at the end of the day, we love each other. Mm. Yeah. So, Steve, I'm curious. Um, that first relationship with Andrew, you said that that was your first like big relationship, but I'm curious: yeah. had he been in open relationships in the past? Or no, he only been in monogamous relationships. He had only been in monogamous relationships before, and he'd been in quite long relationships as well. And so I sort of came in this tornado into his life, and I, you know, I still wonder what's it, what is he, what's this guy doing with me? You know, <laughs> um, you know. So I you kind of had to navigate that shift as well. I, I'm curious, like, how did you even begin that conversation about, hey, like we. We've been monogamous for a period of time and I think that as much as I, I feel a certain way about you, there's experiences that I want to go and have. Like, Can you talk us through that transition? Yeah, it's a long transition. It's a long series of conversations and they're, they're really adult conversations and it actually really started with us looking at our relationship and, and assessing what do we want out of it and what rules do we want to live by. And we both went into the relationship with those standard rules and standard understanding of what a relationship looks like. And we sat down and had a conversation and said, you know what, we can write our own rules. We can decide what our relationship looks like. And other people don't have to understand it. We don't. We also don't have to justify it to other people. Mm. We can just have our relationship and make it work for us. We actually start off with a conversation of, you know, around the word cheating, around what cheating would mean. And it's like, if one of us were to cheat on the other is it worth ending the relationship over that? Even though we have this incredible love, this incredible relationship, why should that act end our relationship? Why should that have such a big impact on our lives when, you know, if it's if it's just a fleeting sexual encounter, um, why should that ruin things? Um, and to us, that didn't make sense. And so we went, okay, well, that means we should go into an open relationship because, you know, we want to be together, but we also want to have these other experiences. And um, then it got a bit more complicated, sort of on my end, um, as I went through therapy and, um, you know, got to understand my sexuality a bit more and understand how my past experiences inform how I experience my sexuality now and sort of an understanding that I'm more sort of heteroflexible. So while I'm very biromantic, these days, whilst my sexuality is, is very fluid, there's a term called the bi-cycle. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Uh, you know, it's when when your, your sexuality and the way that you're attracted to people can change. And so when I went through a really heavy bi-cycle where I, it was terrifying. It was, it was actually utterly terrifying. I couldn't sleep. I was up you know, I was crying for days because I had lost my attraction to men all of a sudden, almost felt overnight. It was really, really full on. And I had to, and I confided in Andrew, I'm just like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what's going on. And this is when I went into therapy and sort of understood, well, you know, this is actually a normal thing. You're just one of these people that experiences it this way. And so that was a conversation that I, that, that we had together. And he went, well, you know, that's you're, there's, you're fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. This is just what you're going through. Do you still love me? Of course, we love each other. So, how do we, how do we make you feel better? And that was by um, opening up a relationship a bit further into polyamory, so that I could then have deeper relationships with people. At that conversation, so you know, there are these different levels of, you know, what, what does cheating look like? Should that end our relationship? No. So let's open our relationship. And then the next part of it was sort of, you know. Can, can we address each other's needs 100%? And, and we went, no, of course not. There are certain things that either of us can't give to each other. It's why we have friendships. It's why we have relationships with other people. There are just certain things your partner can't do for you. 
And so it was from that point that we then, okay, so I'm, you know, we're both allowed to explore um, these relationships with other people when we need and when we want and with consent. And, uh, you know, the, the way that we navigate that is always a little bit different. You know, do you want to know details? Maybe some, maybe, maybe more. Um, and it, it's interesting, but it's, you know, that's just the ongoing conversation. This is a conversation my partner and I have been having for three years now. And it's a conversation we'll continue to have. You know, I described to him um, with you both um, just before we started recording as my six foot one cat, who's a, <laughs> a little bit moody. And, uh, you know, he's an Englishman. He's not great with emotions and opening up. And it took a little while to crack that, that eggshell. But once we got open and opened that dialogue up, it means that we can keep it going and you check in on, on each other. You make sure, hey, is there, you know, how, how's this? Is everything all right? Am I doing anything that makes you uncomfortable? Are you doing anything that's making me feel uncomfortable? And how do we move forward together? And it's always together. Like it's just that, that notion of doing this together where we're on this journey through life. We're each other's other half. Um, how do we get through it? Mm. Um, I really love so much of what you've shared and I'm a really big fan of Esther Perel and one of the things that she points out is that monogamous used to mean one partner for life and in our current society we kind of use that term as monogamous meaning one partner at a time so we've already dropped away like the lifetime thing so um, I'm really curious um, for someone who's maybe only ever seen monogamous relationships that's what they've been modeled that's what they live in can you share a little bit about your perspective of what the difference is between an open relationship and a polyamorous relationship? Yeah. So just for, from my experience, um, an open relationship was that we could, um, you know, have sex with other people. So, you know, go and have a hookup, give a blowjob in the toilets at the club, like it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if we're going back to like, you know, my pre-relationship days, those were some of my favorite things, you know, just, you know, <laughs> drag someone into the toilet cubicle and have a good time. And it's, um, you know, and at that time I was really appreciative. It was like, oh, thank you. Thank you, honey, for, you know, I'll be home. I'll be home by 1 a.m. Don't worry. Um, I, th I think it was really interesting what you said, though, like, to begin with, that the first bit of the conversation was like, what does cheating actually mean for you? Because uh, I think that that definition or that word or that term can mean so many different things to so many different people. Yeah, definitely. And at that time, so, you know, cheating w within that sort of framework would have been entering into a closer relationship with someone so more than sex and so that would be the distinction so the open relationship was really just about sex and then the sort of polyamory side of that and i use polyamory as sort of a broad umbrella term just where you know i'm allowed to have or we're both allowed to have you know romantic deeper relationships with other people that also include sexual relationships and so um that's where that part of the conversation went to um where that I was able to go out and, and, and date people and, and meet people and, and express myself. I was just really lucky that, that my partner understands that I had repressed myself for so many years. And, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, especially people who come out later in life, will understand this, that, you know, you feel like you have to catch up. Or well, not that you have to catch up, but that you have missed out on a lot of life's experiences. And I'm just really, really, really lucky that my partner says to me, I want you to have those experiences. I want you to feel enriched. And, you know, I don't need my partner's permission because I, I you know, if I wanted to go off and do that, then I would, you know. But my relationship is so important to me that it, it's a decision between both of us. Mm. Um, and that's the most important thing. Um, because I wouldn't want to do any of this without him. And yeah. um, since, you know, we, we've gone moved into that space, I've now had a, a couple of really wonderful, meaning, meaningful relationships with other people, and they've just really shown me how wonderful life can be, how much love there is, and also how much love I'm capable of giving as well. And something that really surprised me moving into sort of that polyamorous space was that my relationships with other people improved my primary relationship with my partner. Um, I reflected, got to reflect on a lot of my behaviours, a lot of um, my thoughts and sort of how I moved about the world because by put, taking myself into different contexts, you can sort of look in on yourself and it actually really improved my relationship with Andrew because we, we went into 
into areas that a lot of couples don't want to discuss. We talked about really hard things and we got kept that conversation going and it was just, you know, it just, in the, in the weirdest ways it improved our relationship. And I'm trying to think of examples, just like, you know, I'm a very touchy feeling person and my giant cat downstairs is not so touchy feely. <laughs> and I, I sort of realized, you know, when I've been in a relationship where I've got another relationship where that dynamic is different, I went, oh, actually this is, you know, there can be some discomfort in how people interact with you. And I sort of went, oh, I've been crossing my partner's boundaries. I'm actually going to reflect on how I'm behaving and make sure that we're on the same page. Opening up our relationship has just brought out all of these different surprises and they've all been really, really, really positive. Yeah. We've had um, more than a handful of, of couples on the show who um, have had stages of their relationship being open or polyamorous or ethically non-monogamous or whatever language yeah. you kind of want to use, but yeah. something outside of our very um, rigid framework for monogamy. And I think the common theme or thing that I've noticed from all of those of those couples and individuals who have had those experiences, they've talked about how much it has increased their level of trust and communication within their relationship with their primary mm. partner because yeah. those are the things that you need a lot more of when there's a little bit more space and gray area yeah it's you're tackling the hard stuff head on um and the, you know, we've acknowledged throughout all of these four and a half years that there are make or break situations there are there are forks in the road and we get to decide which direction we take mm -hmm. um, we get to decide if there's a boundary we get to decide what our red lines are um, and you know if you follow the rule book you, you already know which direction you're going to go but it's really really liberating to be able to to be with your partner and go you know what let's go this way let's go this way and see how it goes uh, let's go this way check in on each other and see how it goes and then wonderful things can happen. Um, if you get to another fork in the road and you're like, oh, you know, not sure how this bit is going, it's it's not make or break. It's it's let's try a different direction. And that's and that's that is, you know, that's the trust and that's the communication. And, you know, this is my first ever relationship. And I have no idea how like I, I can even articulate this. It's not something I ever learned. It's not something I ever read about. It's just it's been not the learning blueprint it. you were given. No, nah, um, it's just something I've been learning on the fly. It just goes down to that patience as well, because if, you know, if we were all less patient with each other, then, you know, we'd all run for the hills. I mean, just been really, really lucky to have such wonderful people in my life. Mm. I think the key thing there too is that, like, that commitment to doing this together as well yeah. and exploring it together and, and checking in. I think where it can go wrong is when people, when there's one person in a relationship like, yep, I want to open up this relationship and is going to do it regardless of whether the other person actually is um, is invested in doing that or not. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, like, it definitely was sort of very lopsided for quite a while in that I was the one going off and doing all the exploring and, you know, the self-discovery and having all the fun and, and my primary partner, um, you know, was doing less of that. And, um, you know, that can he had a, a, um, self-esteem issues and all sorts of other things that we were trying to work through. And so when he actually, you know, actually quite recently sort of like burst through that and I've been watching him go off and have his fun, you know, he told me about his grinder account and I'm like, Oh, how popular are you? You know, we were on a holiday and I'm like, you know, you're getting some locals and it's actually really cool to be able to have those conversations with your partner and to celebrate it. And I look at myself and, you know, I, I believe in in acknowledging your emotions and acknowledging your feelings and not gaslighting yourself. And, you know, there have definitely been periods over our relationship where I was sure like I had a jealous streak or I had some insecurities. And so for me to actually just prove that completely wrong and celebrate that my partner's going and getting BJ's Lord knows where, <laughs> um, for me to actually go like, heck, yes, I'm so happy for you. I mean, you know, it's awesome. <laughs> Um, so, Steve, how have you gone about managing, I guess, your energy or your distribution of your of your time when you have been in multiple relationships at the same time? Yeah, um, that's a difficult one. And, you know, it's never an easy thing, um, especially, you know, if you've got health issues or, or work issues or, or, or any, any sort of other issues, you know, that can really impact how you distribute your energy between relationships. 
Um, but it's it's open conversations that you have with all of your partners, um, whether they be formal arrangements. You know, I, I know from other people there are formal arrangements. You know, a midweek thing, a weekend thing, or it's chuck just, everyone in a group chat and just give them an update. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Meet me in the toilet stall at this time. Um, <laughs> it's not an easy thing, and there's no there's no right or wrong way to do it, because you know, in the um, sort of ethically non monogamous space. Um, you know, there are terms like primary partners and secondary partners. And so the way that you distribute your time is, is different. You know, I live with my primary partner and so I'm spending a lot more time with him. Um, and, you know, last year I had a long-term relationship with someone. And um, the way that we worked around that was that I got to spend a lot of my free time with her and we got to express our relationship in a really, really fun way. Um, but then that also, you know, has limitations as well, because then we're not also building a, a stronger foundation as well. You know, a, a relationship can't be made up of only good times. Um, relationships also involve the bad times. And so, you know, going through all of that, I, I you know, learned a lot more about um, how relationships work and, and where my energy levels go and also what spaces and relationships I should be entering um, and which I shouldn't be, you yeah. Mm. And I imagine that that's quite, would be quite challenging to do both while you're going through it, but maybe while your partner's going through things like a new honeymoon phase with a brand new, exciting, <laughs> fun partner that they don't have to talk about household <laughs> tasks with or, you know, sharing finances or any of the like real adulting, yeah. sometimes boring parts of being in a cohabitation relationship. And then on the flip side of that, it's probably really hard to navigate any sense of heartbreak or loss when those relationships end as well watching your your partner go through it or going through it while you're still very much connected to that relationship yeah definitely you know the the honeymoon phase is infectious um it's incredible but um you know for me with my partner you know i'm an excited puppy and often have too much energy and so he was very happy just you know you go off and have your honeymoon <laughs> <laughs> you go off and have your honeymoon i'm i'm happy to see you happy and i'm so lucky to have that um really really lucky to have that um but then yeah when you when you go through difficulties in your relationship um that that can impact your other relationships and you know my partner was sad for me it was very very sad for me when when my other relationship ended and to have that support there was also, I felt very lucky. It's, it's actually, my therapist always tells me off for saying that I'm lucky because there's no such thing as luck. It's about, you know, what you'll put into, into your life, into, into the world beforehand that gets you into those circumstances. But uh, it felt very good to have someone there to support me. But, you know, that's what they're, we're there for, you know, whether it's dealing with family problems, whether it's dealing with work problems or whether it's dealing with heartbreak outside of the relationship, it's because we're there together. Um, it, no matter what it is, we support each other. We, we support each other in bad times and we celebrate the good times. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing this, Steve. I'm, I'm curious, though. I want to end on two things. I would love to know, like, what are some of the practical and tactical things that you're doing um, with Andrew to keep that relationship fueled up, but also your relationship with yourself? So you can choose where we start. Do you want to do you or your relationship? Uh, me, <laughs> I think. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm going to therapy which is really important. <laughs> yeah, yes, so therapy for everyone. <laughs> I'm going to therapy. Um, I'm talking and reaching out to people like myself. I'm always looking for people who are like me because, you know, whilst I'm this, you know, prominent advocate, I'm still terrified on the inside. And so I, I'm always looking for positive examples of people because that helps me work on myself these things just sort of have a way of transferring into what your relationship is if we're both happy and if i'm feeling fulfilled and and enjoying my life then that reflects into my relationship and so like i'm i also just do other simple things you know i go to the gym and i keep fit um, you know, work is awful at the moment. So, you know, that's not, that's not what I'm going to mention, you know, it, you know, it's not all roses, but you know, there are just those little things that I do to keep my mental health as good as it can be. Mm. Um, that's not necessarily saying it's good. No, it's, you know, without therapy, without support, you know, it, it would be a lot worse and going to the gym and keeping physically fit, just 
having those sorts of things in my life to give me a strong foundation because you know there's that there's that foundation that I give myself and there's that foundation that my partner gives in my relationship and those are the two things that keep me up really mm. yeah and that's a common theme of this show about that your relationship with yourself sets the tone for every other relationship that you have yeah. and exactly what you just acknowledge. Like if I wasn't doing all of these things, like I might not be 10 out of 10 right now, but imagine what it might be if I wasn't going to the gym I'm and a, therapy. No, I'm a nine and a half. <laughs> that's great. Nine and a half is pretty good. Uh, you, you can drive a lot of kilometers on a nine and a half full tank. Disclaimer, yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> So what about what about your relationship? Is there anything that um, any practices or habits or rituals that you and Andrew share that help keep that relationship fueled up? Yeah, it sounds silly, but our pet names, he stole mine. I called him Pookie first, then he started calling me Pookie. Uh, our pet names, we sing together all the time. Mm. We We'll be watching TV and someone will say something funny and we'll just break out in song for seven minutes. Oh, it's like living in a real life sitcom. <laughs> it, it is. It is. Uh, you know, I'm looking at these little things every day that make our relationship special. It's the cuddling. It's it's giving each other a big kiss. It's sending each other a little love heart emoji in the middle of the workday when it's really crap and busy. It's those little reminders that we're each other's special person mm -hmm. and the things that only we understand and the things that would look entirely bizarre to other people looking in, <laughs> yeah. but, are, but are perfectly normal to us. Um, you know, those are the little special things, yeah. I love that so much. And it is those tiny little romantic rituals or those little inside jokes and those things that, that you know that only your partner really understands. And yeah, that's what, that is definitely what makes that the secret language. Yeah. yeah. The secret yeah. handshake. The secret yeah. eye, eye connection moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It becomes problematic when we do it when we're out and people are like, what is <laughs> hey, going on? Yeah. Why are you singing about that drink or like, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it gets it gets a bit funny, but you know that's when we look at each other like, oh yeah, you know, we're we're in this, you know, yeah. we're, we're we're each other's other half. It's funny. That's it. I have loved this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing about your your journey, your relationship, your evolution. Um, I want to end on one final thing. If um, if someone is sitting with something that they haven't yet fully acknowledged about themselves, whether or not that it's their sexuality or a desire or a wish or a, something that they're not yet fully owning and stepping into what's the like one piece of advice or recommendation that you would have for that person i would definitely tell that person to not be afraid you know don't be afraid the world is full of opportunities the world is diverse and wonderful and it can be crap at times and you will encounter crap but do not let that get in the way of you living your life to the fullest because you can, like, you absolutely can. That's something I wish I was told when I was younger, when I was in the closet, when, you know, I was hiding my HIV status, when I was, when I was afraid of the world. What I wish I could have been told was don't be afraid because if you are afraid, you're, you're hiding, you're not, you're not out there flying and I want everyone to be out there flying. Love it so much. Thank you so much. Um, Steve, I feel like we didn't get to touch on too much about your um, HIV advocacy. If there's something that people can uh, watch, read, listen, do to better understand or better support, what would that be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just I'll start off by explaining a little bit about the science. So there's a thing called U equals U, which means undetectable equals untransmittable. And so someone like me who's HIV positive, the medication I take uh, reduces the viral load in my body to an undetectable level. And that means that I can't pass on the virus to anyone. No matter how hard I try it, it's actually scientifically impossible. I feel like you did have a good crack at it in those club bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that joke is okay. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely... <laughs> there was transferring happening of some yeah, kind. <laughs> absolutely. But the thing is that there's absolutely zero risk in having sex with me in, in all of that jazz. Um, and, you know, with, with my partner, Andrew... Um, with my other significant partners, you know, I've often been the the first and only HIV positive person they've had sex with, and so and while they may not necessarily understand the science, they listen. And, and you know, I faced a lot of rejection in my life. And what I'll tell people is, 
you know, if someone who is living with HIV like myself opens up to you about their HIV status, they're letting you in on their journey. They're not a risk to your health or safety. They're letting you in on their journey and they, they want you to be part of their life. You know, we're opening ourselves up to risk if we're telling you our HIV status. You know, I've, I've had some really, really terrible reactions. And so if someone's doing that, it's actually, a, it's, a, it's a gift. It's an act of love, someone, someone doing that. And also, um, you know, for, for people... Um, to learn more about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, this is the pill that prevents HIV transmission for HIV-negative people. Um, one of the biggest boundaries for me is for my female sexual partners, none of them um, really are able to access PrEP. It's something that's really heavily marketed towards gay men and the rest of the community gets uh, really misses out on it. And I think it's really, really important for everyone, not just gay men, to be aware of HIV prevention. And so one way of HIV prevention is, you know, have sex with me because I can't pass it on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I fully invite everyone. Or, um, you know, if you're an HIV negative person, you know, there are these wonderful things like PrEP and medication that you take and it prevents HIV transmission. Thank you so much for sharing um, and thank you for being so open and sharing with us today. Um, To say thank you, we've actually um, provided seven days of training sessions for young parents to impart knowledge um, about child nutrition, immunization, contraception, family planning, all of the things that can set a child up for a really successful life in India. Um, This project is looked after by reduced inequalities and has been made possible via our partnership with Buy One, Give One. So thank you so much for being here and making that possible. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's excellent. No, no worries. So, Steve, if people want to connect with you or learn a little bit more about your story, how can they do that? Yeah, you can head to my Instagram. It's at Storven with three S's, S-S-S-T-O-R-V-E-N. You can message me and ask me what that backstory is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, you can also connect with me through the Bobby Goldsmith Foundation. I'm an ambassador for this organization. They support people living with HIV. They provide really great services on the ground. So you can head to bgf.org.au to learn a little bit more about that. And you can also connect with me through that organization. Um, I just started a threads, but I don't know how to connect me. Connect you all with that. Uh, I think we're all just learning it on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll but throw some links into the show notes as well if anyone yeah. wants to try and connect. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of my advocacy work, if you do want to get in touch with me with, um, regarding um, bi plus bisexuality things, if you want to get in touch with me regarding HIV things, LGBTIQ plus community things, please feel free to get in touch with me on social media. Or a pegging workshop, which we didn't even get to talk about. <laughs> pegging workshop coming up in August. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> pegging is the future. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks heaps for joining us. If you love what we're doing here and want more, subscribe to the Date Forever podcast to make sure you never miss an ep. Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.